Has there ever been an experiment done to prove that the Earth is revolving around the sun? Yes, there was uh, several experiments in the 1800s. Dominique Arego, uh, Armand Fuseau, uh, Augustin Fresnel, but one of the most famous was the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887. Let's assume the ether frame moves relative to the Earth from left to right. Michelson Morley used a half silvered mirror to split a beam of light so that it travels in two different directions along two paths of equal length. This is the light beam before it is split. Moving in a perpendicular direction to the ether frame, this beam would be blown off course and would have to travel a little further. Traveling back down this path again, perpendicular to the ether, would also move this beam off course, if the ether existed. This beam, moving parallel to the ether and in the same direction, would increase its speed. This beam, again parallel to the ether, but moving in the opposite direction, would be slowed down. Here the two light beams are recombined together, and if they are in phase, they will constructively interfere. But if the speed was different in the two paths, they would combine to give an interference pattern. No. Tell us about that. Well, they used light beams to measure whether the Earth was moving, and they found that there was no movement. Was, the Earth has to be moving 30 kilometers per second to complete its annual revolution. And they found out that it wasn't moving by, in a very precise, Michelson could have calculated it to one hundredth of what he got in his experiment. That's how sensitive his instruments were. What did the experiment involve in terms of apparatus? So we can get a concrete understanding of, of well, what they Well, if, the if the Earth is moving around the sun and we shoot that light beam in the direction that the Earth is moving, okay, and then we shoot another light beam perpendicular to that, well, the one that's in the direction of the Earth's movement should be impeded in some way if it's moving through space, whereas this one is going perpendicular would not be impeded. Why not? Because it's not going through space. It's okay. just going north and south. Okay. Okay? And what they found, they expected to have a 30 kilometer difference between these two light beams. There was no difference. So the natural interpretation, and even Einstein admits this, Mach admits this, Born admits this, the natural interpretation is that the Earth isn't moving. So how do we get out of that? Well, you invent special relativity. And now you say, well, the reason that light beam wasn't affected when it went toward the motion of the Earth is because the apparatus shortened. Huh? <laughs> yeah, Michelson's apparatus shortened as it was going with the Earth in its orbit around the wait, sun. No, wait, you're, you're telling me that the contraction of mass yes. was invented to explain away the results of the Michelson-Morley yes. experiment? Yes, and that's what my book will tell you, and it's been admitted by all the scientists. Well, isn't there any experimental confirmation that as you approach the speed of light, there's a contraction effect? I, I, the impression is that there's all kinds of experimental confirmation. That was this. invented. It was, there's no proof to it. All really? These, yes, all the physicists will tell you there's no proof Not, not to that it. I'm surprised you understand. Yeah. I, I know what the scientific community is capable of in terms of mass deception. Mm. Evolution is a mass deception. But I wasn't aware that they don't really have any even uh, uh, purported scientific confirmation in terms of physical measurement. No, nobody of the contraction measured, effect. Nobody measured a contraction, but they put it into a mathematical formula called the Lorentz transform, and it's probably the most famous equation used in physics today. Does, it, does anyone expressly admit that hey, we had to come up with this contraction effect? because otherwise we're stuck with a motionless Yes, earth. the very guy who invented it. Tell me what Heinrich tell Lorenz. Me what he Heinrich Lorenz says, I don't have any other explanation to this experiment of Michael Samorley unless I contract the apparatus. Otherwise, we're going to have to believe the earth is standing still in space. Unbelievable. Yeah. Can you, can you give a, an approximate page reference for me to your <laughs> book? I want to go back and read that right away. Uh, I'll, I'll send you an email. I'll show you where it is. If a telescope is pointing at a star and both are stationary, then obviously the light comes straight into the telescope. In 1729, Bradley found that he had to tip his telescope forward very slightly to get a star in the center of his telescope. It was assumed that this was due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Let us assume that the telescope was moving at 5 mile an hour and had to be tipped 5 degrees. This 5 degree tipping, however, could equally be caused by the ether 
moving at five mile an hour, carrying the stars around the Earth. As we see here, the light would be coming in at the same angle and the telescope would still have to be tipped five degrees. So tipping the telescope does not tell us whether it is the starlight moving or the telescope moving. However, there is a simple experiment that can determine whether it was the Earth that was moving or the ether and starlight. All that you had to do was record the tipping required for any particular star, then fill the telescope with water, which greatly slows down the speed of light in the telescope. So here is the moving telescope filled with water, tipped at 5 degrees, and you can see that the starlight does not now reach the eyepiece at the bottom. This is because the starlight moves much more slowly when passing through water. However, if the telescope is tipped further, say 10 degrees, then the starlight will then be visible again in the eyepiece. It has to be tipped further because the light is now slower when in the telescope. But if the starlight is going past the telescope at 5 mile an hour, then when it is filled with water, no t further tipping is needed because the light is coming in at 5 degrees anyway. The starlight stays on the same path, but is only travelling slower in the water. To recap, if it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. Here's another objection. If everything is moving, in other words, all the stars in the, in the universe are moving, how could we possibly determine if we are the center of this moving universe? Over the past decade or so, we have seen out to the very limits of the observable cosmos. We've mapped its largest structure, the cosmic microwave background, the oldest light in the universe according to the standard Big Bang model of cosmology. What we have discovered is shocking. On the very largest scale, we see a pattern of really big hot and cold spots which line up around a special axis, which has been dubbed the axis of evil. And it's quite puzzling. Why is there a special direction in space? Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you asked that because in 2009, they sent up a probe called the Planck probe. It just came back with the results in 2013 in March. I don't know if you heard about it or not. No. The European Space Agency set it up in cooperation with NASA. This was the third attempt that they had to nullify the data that they were finding in the cosmic microwave background radiation that permeates the whole universe, that the Earth was in the center of the universe. The first one they sent up was in 1990 called the COBE probe. It came back, sure, the Earth was in the center. The WMAP was the second one in 2001, came back with the same data. And what they tried to do was say that this was all an error. It was some kind of misreading or it was, uh, there was contamination in the apparatus or the sky or whatever. So they sent up a third probe in 2009, just came back in 2013. Guess what? Same exact results. Same exact results, and what were the interpretations? Well, the Earth has to be in the center of the universe, and we have somebody quoted in our book, Lawrence Krauss of the Arizona State University, who says, yeah, this means we're in the center of the universe. Let's, let's pick up on that point a bit. You mentioned that the background radiation, microwave radiation mm -hmm. in the universe, supplied data from which it became apparent that the Earth was, in fact, at the center of a moving universe. Explain why that is so. Why do, the, why do these data confirm that? Okay. Well, the Big Bang Theory predicts that there was an explosion 13.7 billion years ago. Okay? So if there was an explosion, then that means the explosion had to come out equal, equal on all sides of the sphere. It had to be what they call homogeneous. Okay? And that's naturally accepted. It's like homogenized milk. Sure. You, know, you shake that thing up and you can't, you can't see one place from another place. It's all homogenized. And that's what they needed for this Big Bang universe. What they found when they sent these three probes up, yeah, some of it was homogeneous, 
but it's like having a bowl full of jello with two swords going through the middle of the jello. What are the okay. swords? What the swords, swords are the orientation of the cosmic microwave background radiation throughout the universe. Well, what do you mean by the orientation? Okay, there's, there's hot and cold spots they found. It's not homogeneous. There's hot and cold spots in this microwave background radiation. And if you align all these cold spots, it forms an X through the whole universe. Unbelievable. And guess what's in the middle? <laughs> oh, you're kidding. No. This is what the data show. This is what okay, the data shows. Okay, come on shows. now. What, what, what mainstream publication recognizes The this? University of Michigan, Dragon Hutterer, Craig Copey, uh, Glenn Starkman. These are all the guys who have done all the work on this microwave radiation. They write it in their papers. They wrote one in 2004, 2008, 2010, and 2012, and they're writing another one on the Planck probe. So you're saying these space probes were designed to explain away the X represented by the hot and cold spots. They wanted spots. to make sure it wasn't an accident. Okay, so there were how many probes in total? Three in 20 years. And you're saying that all three confirmed what then? That the Earth is in the center of the universe. On the basis of the hot and cold spots? Yes. Whose alignment represents an X. An X. And at the center of the X is the Earth. Right, and they call that X the axis of evil. That was coined. The scientists call that the axis of called evil. Called it the axis of evil. <laughs> that was coined in 2004 when Bush went into Iraq. Remember, he called them the axis of evil. So this cosmologist just picked it up and said, yeah, well, here's the axis of evil right here in the universe. So, in other words, they're enraged by the finding. Oh, yeah. Because it upsets their worldview, which yeah. has to displace the Earth's special position in the universe. Yeah which fits in rather nicely with a divinely created universe right. all made of, for man. All of cosmology is based on what we call the Copernican principle. Every piece of data that they get in their telescope has to be filtered through the Copernican principle. And that's what the Big Bang Theory does, NASA does it, ESA does it, everybody does it. The, the upsetting thing about this microwave radiation is it just totally defies the Copernican principle. The last probe confirmed that as well, you say? The last probe, yeah. As where, a matter of fact... Where, where was that result reported? Obviously everywhere, but give me some examples. Uh, March 21st in the European Space Agency report. As a matter of fact, it's in our movie. What's their attempt to explain the latest probe's findings away? Anomalies. Anomalies? Mm -hmm. And all the, anom the anomalies conveniently line up in a non-anomalous way to verify their model. Right. Uh, this is amazing. Yeah. So this, this brings us to the question of motive. We've been hinting at it throughout mm. the discussion. There's obviously a motive at work here. I, I, w many people have recognized, not just believers, not just Catholics, but people like David Berlinsky, for example, that science has become an ideology. Mm. Maybe you could take up that theme as we close out this interview. Yeah. Isn't there an ideological component? Here? Yeah, I, I would even go so far as to say it's a religion. Science okay. is a religion today. It's scientism. Uh, and they've already got the parameters within, they want to, within which they want to interpret the data, and they're not going to go outside those parameters. This is a perfect example. Uh, you do get some of them that break out of it, and they say, yeah, well, this defies the Copernican principle. We've read many papers like that, and we quote them in our book. Okay? But the motivation is, if the Copernican principle is wrong, that means all of science is wrong. Everything, cosmogony, paleontology, cosmology, archaeology, everything now becomes suspect because we can't support these long ages. We can't support this vast universe. As a matter of fact, we're in the center of it. How, do you, how does that happen? Well, it's not going to happen by chance. Someone had to put it there, you see, and that's what they're scared of. That's the motivation.